Then the classic battle of all, all time was, was the Battle of Jutland in 1916. And then there was this extraordinary event, which I think you might find, well, I'm sure you know all about, but after the, uh, the British victory at the end of the First World War, the entire German fleet, which had been involved in the Battle of Jutland, was interned in Scarpa Flow, which is this harbour in, um, in the Orkney Islands and guarded on the outside by British warships. The German officers were allowed, uh, and ratings were allowed to remain on their ships. The war was over, their guns were spiked, they couldn't do any damage. But there was a prearranged radio signal went out, a coded radio signal from all the German ships to each other. And on receipt of that signal, all of the ships blew up demolition charges. And before the eyes of the frustrated Royal Navy, who wanted these ships for themselves, the entire fleet sank wow. into Scarpa Flow. Wow. But the interesting coda to that is to this day, I mean, you can see the ships if you fly into the airport in the Orkney Islands, you can see these shadowy forms, not terribly far below the surface, and still some of them leaking oil. But to this day, divers go down occasionally to take plates of the ship off and bring them to the surface because it's very high quality steel and because it was all made before the dropping of the first atom bomb, there is absolutely no trace of radioactivity in the steel. And so for very, very sensitive scientific experiments, that steel is absolutely vital. So unpolluted steel and the converse of that, or rather the, you know, the, the reciprocal, if you like, is that down in South Georgia, in the Southern Ocean, there were two herds of reindeer that were brought to feed the whalers who lived there in about 1915, 1916. They are the only herds of reindeer in the world, and that's including the ones here in North America, that are not suffering at all from the radiation from the Chernobyl accident in the Ukraine. Mm. So the unpolluted reindeer in the south and unpolluted steel in Scarpa Flow. The sort of thing that I thought you might find fascinating. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, I heard, I heard that the Titanic is the exact opposite that, of that, a very inferior steel it's that very had a lot of sulfur steel. in it. Exactly. And that she might have actually been able to survive the collision with the iceberg had the steel been better. Had she been German. Had she been German. <laughs> Titanic. <laughs> with a K. Right. Yes, with a K. <laughs> So today, here we are with our, um, and, and here in Canada, we're all very aware of the sorry state of the oceans, and we've experienced the collapse of the cod fishery. What caused that? What, in your mind, what caused the collapse of the cod fishery? Well, uh, naked greed, for one thing, and the incompetence of the Canadian government. I'm sorry to say it. I'm sure you all know this story only too well. I mean, the Canadian Fisheries Department set catch limits, bowing to the wishes of Newfoundland politicians largely, which were contrary to all scientific advice, and they just destroyed the fishery. It was a terrible, terrible tragedy. I mean, this was a fishery which they used to say that one could, I mean, it was joking, of course, but there were so many cod that you could walk from Iceland to Newfoundland on the backs of these great silvery fish that were everywhere. And if you, you know, you, you go back through Netflix or whatever to see, um, you know, Freddie Bartholomew and Spencer Tracy and uh, that wonderful uh, version of Captain's Courageous, the Kipling, Kipling novel, you see just how rich the number of fish that were scooped up in these dories and taken home to the, to the mothership. I had well, a Newfoundlander tell me that if you wanted to go fishing for cod, you had to take one out just to get your line in. <laughs> I believe it. A good Newfie joke, yes, indeed. <laughs> but... It is quite extraordinary that that fishery in such short order could be destroyed. And so one of the lingering after effects and beneficial effects, I think, of the Falklands War, because the British have control over a lot of sea, not just the Falklands and their territorial waters, but South Georgia, South Orkney, South Shetlands, which are very, very rich in this enormous and enormously ugly fish called the Patagonian toothfish which appears, of course, on your menus or our menus here as Chilean sea bass. <laughs> it is neither Chilean nor a bass, but is the only word that has anything to do with what it is, is sea. Well, they could have been in exactly the same sort of trouble as the Newfoundland cod, because the demand is, is extraordinary. But the, the Brits saw what had happened to Newfoundland, and they decided they've got to get this fishery in order and chase away 
uh, people that would take it illegally. And so for that, you need a big fleet of fishery protection vessels with big guns. And you need, you know, satellite transponders and everything to monitor who is fishing and the catch limits set according to the advice of scientists who study these creatures. And the result is that the Patagonian toothfish fishery in the South Atlantic is very healthy. And the poor old Newfoundland cod is going to take years to recover. If it does. Yes, I thought I saw something just two days ago, some optimism, but that was probably put out by the fisheries ministry. And I think <laughs> one, one would discount that. So when you stand on a seashore, when you stand on the shore of the Atlantic and look out, what do you see? Well, for a start, I see something which is very, very different from the Pacific. I mean, I think of the Pacific and indeed the Mediterranean and the Indian Oceans as being blue and fringed with palm trees and coral. But the Atlantic is a gray and industrial, muscular ocean. And I think that Maysfield poem, you know, dirty British coaster with a salt cake smokestack butting through the channel in the mad March days, is what I see. It's a... It's a mighty, dangerous workman's ocean and with a whole host of stories. And so I have an enormous affection for it. It's where I grew up, after all. And uh, to see it on this side, I think I, was, I spoke to someone from, from Nova Scotia, I think it was today, who said there is something elementally different about standing at Peggy's Cove and looking out on the Atlantic and standing on you know, the Queen Charlotte Islands or um, uh, Vancouver Island and looking out at the Pacific, and somehow the Pacific, big though it may, may be, just doesn't cut it. <laughs> <laughs> and you will enjoy reading Atlantic by Simon Winchester. It's a, it's a wonderful read. Uh, it's just such a brilliant, uh, brilliant writer. I just want to switch before we uh, turn it over to you for questions. Another book that Simon wrote is called The Man Who Loved China. And it's, uh, has anybody read it? Has it come out? Oh, so you have. Well, we won't spend much time on this, but it's a remarkable story of uh, Joseph Needham, who really, I think in Canada, we tend to think of uh, Norman Bethune in, in China. <laughs> Joseph Needham isn't as, uh, as well celebrated. And yet, just tell me a bit about this remarkable man who was a Brit, <clears throat> but loved China and really introduced the world to China. He was an extraordinary individual, born in 1900 in, in London, um, very left-wing in his politics when he went up to Cambridge in 1917, an extraordinary linguist. I mean, he had great, great uh, language abilities. Um, was extremely attractive, very tall, with a great mass of floppy brown hair, little round spectacles. He looked like sort of Harry Potter on amphetamines. And, <laughs> but and was extremely eccentric. I mean, he was very left-wing. He was also an ardent Christian but he was also a nudist. He took his clothes off at every possibility. He, he, he played the accordion. Someone said, well, thank God, being a, a nudist, he didn't play the cymbals. But <laughs> <laughs> Even the accordion could be dangerous. Isn't it? <laughs> well, I, I think it's said in England, maybe here in Canada as well, that the definition of a gentleman is someone who knows how to play the accordion, but doesn't. <laughs> But he was also, he was a, a Morris dancer. And I don't know if anyone knows about Morris dancing, but is, you know, you put straw and bells around your wrists and ankles and gyrate to some tuneless dirge played on a pipe. Thank God he didn't do that naked. But you know, he was also, he was a chain smoker, but didn't smoke until 12 each day. He had a cigarette vertically on his desk until the clock in Keys College, Cambridge struck 12. And then he would smoke like industrial. Manchester for the rest of the day, but lived till he was 95. But he was also an inveterate womanizer. He loved women. He was married to a woman called Dorothy. He announced on their wedding day that theirs was to be a thoroughly modern marriage. Um, and if each member wanted to partake in other delights, that was all right by him. Dorothy sort of smiled rather grimly through this <laughs> declaration. And then this was the key to it all, because in 1937, he met a Chinese student who had come to study for a PhD under Dorothy, his wife, and fell in love with her and she with him. And the three of them were subsequently inseparable. They were known as the Needhams. And um, she, uh, Lu Guizhen, her name was, taught Joseph how to speak Chinese. And he...